Welcome back to part two of Catching Up to Fi on the road with the Slackers. And again, I'm here with my co-host, Mark. And I just want to say, if you have not listened to part one of this series, then be sure you go back and give it a listen. There is enough goofiness there to definitely put a smile on anybody's face. So how you doing, Mark? I'm doing awesome. And I love these on the roads. We chatted with members um, of the community on the Alaska cruise, uh, was the last on the road. Uh, this one was recorded right before Camp 5 Midwest, which is held in Minnesota. And it was in uh, September of last year, 2023. And the Slackers got together and rented a house before and after the Camp Fi, and we decided to just put the microphones on and have a fun time. And it definitely was fun, even though we are a group of super geeks, <laughs> super nerds. <laughs> Yeah, and I do have to tell everyone that <laughs> after this, we actually were sitting around watching a, a Kitsis con, uh, continuing education thing on uh, Roth, I actually advanced Roth IRA strategies. And by the end, we we're all like, so when do we hear about the advanced part? It didn't seem very advanced. So it definitely proved that we are super geeks. <laughs> That's right. But we have fun at the same time. So last week, we heard from Bob and Sharon and Kevin, Life and Fire from the slackers. So again, refer back to part one for an explanation of what a slacker is. This week, we're going to chat with Vince and Brianna, and I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, and life for late starters of any age on their journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're going to talk to experts, other late starters, and explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to FI together. So, Vince, I'm so glad that you agreed to chat with us. And I think what we wanted to, to just chat a little bit about was that how you and your spouse handle the money, handle the finances. So tell us a little bit about where you are, whether you're retired or not, and then how it is that you've set things up for a spouse that isn't quite as involved in the financial stuff as yourself. Yeah, so we were both still working part-time. So actually I worked for 33 plus years in high tech. And then in January 21, I retired officially. And then the plan was always to do some part-time work after I retired. So that has all worked out. So my wife, Holly, is still working part-time in the school district. She runs a reading program. And then I do consulting as well. I tend to work less in the summers when she's off and then more during the, during the year when we're both kind of heads down. Mm -hmm. Or so. In, in fact, we've we've seen you working this week. That's against what? all slack of policy. It's all well, somebody has got to pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <for us. laughs> it's all billable hours. <laughs> From a finance perspective, you know, I, I, I've always been the one who uh, managed the finances, tracked things, and kind of had a, I won't say a passion for, but uh, I know how to handle money in some ways. Um, and to just trying to get ahead of things right so we're not always going to be as sharp as ever we did get last year with a financial planner again we've had numerous financial planners through the years but we got with so have you have you always had a financial planner or has that been kind of a sometimes type of thing on and off yeah it's been on and off because we've gone from we had a morgan stanley person at one time stock jockey type thing and then we went after 08, we went to an asset under management, but I could not stomach the 1% for very long. So we bailed on that. And then I guess probably around 16 or so, 2016, 17, started getting more into financial independence type stuff, the usual Mr. Money mustache and all that, and started getting a lot more comfortable doing things on our own. But we were always good savers and always good investors. So... We were lucky that way. 
So it sounds like now you more recently did more of like a fee only financial plan. Yeah. Is that what you did? Yeah. Okay. We got, I mean, we got with Roger. But mm -hmm. it was a retirement planner instead of a financial planner. Did Correct. you see a difference? Absolutely. I mean, your financial planner is all about how do you accumulate money? And the retirement planner is, all right, you have this money now, what are you going to do with it? And so that's what we worked with Roger and with Scott on. And I uh, got a little bit more comfortable. Actually, it was very helpful because I retired in January 21, and then 22 was a tough year. So the first full year of retirement was a down year in the market. It was helpful getting an actual financial plan to get a little bit better dialed in. And frankly, getting a little bit more, I mean, we are confident anyway, but a little more confident after the downturn, the latest one at the end of last year. So that was helpful. The other thing was I'm trying to be intentional about establishing relationships with people that can actually help my wife in the event I predecease, right? So we, we want to have that in place. So we have the trust, we have a trustee, we have all that set and, up. And did she gain comfort from that m most recent financial plan, like understanding like this is doable or oh, without yeah. it just being you? Because I know that would have been my case. Like, <laughs> Yeah, you say it's okay, but is it really okay? Yeah, it was helpful, uh, very helpful, actually, to kind of sit side by side, do it. We had done that before, but it had been several years, and it was a lot more helpful after we pulled the trigger, which may sound kind of foolish to pull the trigger and then do a financial plan, but we had pretty good confidence going in that we were okay, and then just got more confident together working through that process. So... Is the plan moving forward that if something were to happen to you first, does she call that planner that you used or what, what would her steps be? First step is call my brother because he's our executor. He's our trustee right, from a estate planning. And then Kevin's dead file, but I've got a... No more Kevin. No more Kevin file. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but I have a list of here's uh, steps and it's actually not terribly difficult because we use personal capital to manage everything. And then we use a password manager. So if you have the password for the password manager and you have personal, you can type do everything. I mean, it's, it's all right there. So mm -hmm. I like that aspect. So that's the bas basic plan is for now, work with my brother and then also the, with Roger and team. Okay. All right. And so when you worked with Roger to come up with a plan, would that what you would call a um, uh, a fee based plan? There were there was no assets under management there. Correct. correct. Yeah. So we still manage everything. You know, we actually we took kind of a high road approach. I mean, those of you who have kind of listened to Roger a little bit, he's got base great life calculation, and then Jim and Chris on the retirement and IRA show have the MDF, right? Minimum, minimum decade floor. We kind of merged those two together because we wanted. We didn't want to cut things so thin with MDF. We'd like the base great life kind of calculation better. But then, so we use that. And then we also kind of follow Jim and Chris's process around, okay, make sure you've got a plan to cover, in this case, our base great life with guaranteed income. But then also, what are you going to do for inheritance? We have two daughters that are still in college. So it's not top of mind, but it's certainly something we want to be aware of and making sure we have long-term care figured out enough, and then having some buffer and some money for when we slow down, if we need some aging assistance, we have that covered as well. And when you say guaranteed lifetime income, what sources would that be? I mean, obviously Social Security might be one of those, but are there any other sources? Do you have a pension or do you have, or are you gonna buy an annuity or have an annuity? Yeah, so the plan is for me to claim at 870. And then by that time, Holly will be retired. She gets a small pension. So we use that money together and then we'll buy an annuity to cover the gap. And hopefully that's, I'm 60 right now. So that's 10 years from now. So we should have a much better dialed in kind of base great life calculation by the time we get there. But right now we've said, okay, this is what's earmarked. And we've uh, quote unquote set it aside and positioned it. So it's more aggressively invested because we don't need it for 10 years. Gotcha. So I want to ask you the same question I asked Bob and Sharon. Just were you a, a an expense tracker before you retired? Yeah, well, just using 
before we started using personal capital, which was probably years before I retired, something like that. We didn't we didn't track real close at all. And do you track now? Yeah, I mean, we only because it's easy. You just push a button. Mm -hmm. You okay. can see everything. Okay. But we don't use spreadsheets to track things and nothing like that. But I do monitor mm -hmm. what our our spending is, not on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. but try to keep things understood what we're doing right. through the year. And did that give you a, a level of comfort to know what you were spending when you decided to retire? Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to have some... Some people are more precise about it than others, or maybe not as precise, but we know pretty well our, what our expenses are. Things are going to change, right? So God willing, the kids are going to get out of college and not need any help at some point. So some of that spending and tail off. So when you look at your spending before and now kind of in retirement, even though you're part-time working, everybody, always, all the media says 80% of your income. Did you base your retirement spending on your existing spending regardless of income? And do you spend more or less in retirement? Or do you want to spend more or less in retirement, your early retirement, active years, go-go years? And how do you manage your paychecks? Are those bonuses to spending or are those being saved? How does that income and spending levels, how are those planned? That's a lot of questions at once. That's why I'm sitting in your co-pilot seat. <laughs> so paycheck-wise, Holly, we're still banking a lot of hers in, in her retirement because we don't really need the money right now. And then my paycheck, I'm actually making more than what I had anticipated. So we've so far been just kind of setting that aside, if you will. But we have a monthly quote unquote paycheck that comes out of our Vanguard money market account and goes right into checking. And that's our main way of getting money through the year. And actually that's the best, for me, that's the easiest way to see are we kind of on track or because we start with a certain in the checking. And if it drops below that, guess what? We're overspending. <laughs> and so by the end of the year, we, we got a pretty good idea just looking at one account, how we're doing. Uh, spending wise and I'm not intentionally trying to spend more but we we kind of we do I mean we vacation more now we're much more intentional about vacationing during the summertime when Holly's off of work and then when the girls all are some sometimes they're at home sometimes they're gone but we're more intentional about maximizing that time so when you you said that you both retired, but you're both working part-time. So are you still working part-time because of financial reasons or because you need something to do? Financially, neither one of us need to work. Okay. But Holly really likes her job mm -hmm. and gets to work with kids, sees the results, and has a really good group of friends within her work. And that's important to her. Great. And she brings in some money. Excellent. Like the idea of having time to play, but then also having time to work. Because I find the play time, I appreciate it more if I have some time working. And I'm really lucky because the work I do, I like a lot. And the people I work with are great to work with. So I just feel like it's a good balance. And I just, if you read and listen to anything about retirement it's so much is about relationships right and you can easily lose the amount of relationship you're in it's so important to keep those up so one reason why i'm with the slackers <laughs> but also it's another reason why i keep working because i build relationships with our clients as well as the people i work with so do you have any plans for how long either of you will continue the part-time work? The rough plan is, and I mentioned I turned 60 this year, I'm planning to work until 65. And then Holly, who's five years younger than me, will be 60. She gets a little pension bump. That's kind of the rough timeline right now is to work another five years. But we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. Sure. And your kids, you said they're in college now. Do you think... Are they, you know, just now in college or, or are they almost out of college? And when and if they fly the coop, will that change anything? 
Not really. I mean, we were pretty good about setting up 529s for them and have been, have basically said, this is how much you get, right? And then you got to make it work. Well, I meant not financially. I meant like, because, you know, you're an empty nester. Will that change anything? Do you think that might change your timeline for working? Well, I mean, we have one that's already out. Oh. And she's in Louisiana. She's way away. And one that's still at home going to college. So we kind of have a mix. We were empty, nest, empty nesters for two years, year and a half for a while when they were both away. So we've got a feel for what it's like to be empty nesters. Yeah, because I know some people, when that occurs, that changes their mindset. And they're like, okay, now we can travel more. We can do They do not like... hold us back at all. Yeah. Because, okay. I mean, they're, our young, youngest will be 21 and our oldest will be 20, is 22 now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're fine. Yeah. They don't want to do stuff with us anyway. Well, I know that some people mark that Neither as... Neither do we. Yes. But we, we yeah, anyway. <laughs> some people mark that as a time factor. When the kids are out of college, then we're going to do X, Y, Z and so forth. So yeah. that's why I brought it up. Hard and fast. Yeah. I mean, that'd be constraining, right? Why would right. you wait? You know, to... Well, so there you go. You heard it from Vince. Don't wait. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I think that's... You made a comment just a minute ago about that you had a certain amount of money set aside for college and then that was it okay because i think that some of the folks in our audience feel compelled to pay for their kids college to their own detriment that they're they're almost sacrificing their retirement savings so that they can put their kids in college yeah. and that's not necessarily something that has to be done or other, or other expenses Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, the kids' support can get out of control. We kind of look at it as we sent them both through private high school because mm -hmm. we thought that was really important. And that's something that our parents did for us as well. But neither of our parents paid anything for college. So we thought, okay, we'll pay for their college, right? Or just not, and that's better than our parents did. So we're kind of stepping it up. So I feel comfortable with setting those boundaries. It doesn't mean that, you know, if we have the means, maybe we would, we would help them additionally, but we wouldn't let it constrain our lifestyle at all. That'd be sending the wrong message, I think, because you told them this is how much you get. If they don't manage to that, then there has to be some consequences. Well, I, I think it's a great idea to let them know ahead of time what the expectations are how much money there is for college and whether or not the parents are going to pay for college. There's there's nothing that says the parents have to pay for it. Yeah. And I've always said, if you ask 10 different people how you're going to pay for your kid's college, you'll get 10 different answers. And what's right for one family is not right for another. But there is no requirement to completely fund your kid's college when you may have other obligations that at that moment in time are more important. Yeah, absolutely. Great. All right, so Vince, tell us what the slackers mean to you. What do I mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> want to go there. <laughs> you know, a lot of it's already been said, but it's a great group of folks that we can get together, not only simply Zoom calls, but uh, also in person whenever we can. And there's, uh, I think it's a good, amount of healthy peer pressure, if you will. Like I was pressured to go on the Alaskan cruise and I said no, right, for various reasons. And so far, uh, you haven't held it against me, which is good. You're still in the group. You're still in? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't pulled your card yet. <laughs> Probation, any work. <laughs> um, just having people there to kind of make sure you're, you're not slacking, if you will, on the fun side. And also be there to help out when you got questions. I feel like I can ask you guys anything. Like, I've got this issue. Mark and I have talked about how much to support kids. And one of our daughters, or oldest daughters, taking Mark's financial course, which we find very valuable. So I think that's as an example of how we kind of help each other out. It's been really nice. Great. Great. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks for jumping in the hot seat. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So, Mark, I want to ask you a question yeah. but real quick. So, Vince just mentioned your course. Would you explain for our audience what that is? Yeah. So, I teach a financial literacy class in my local high school. I've been doing that for seven years. It's about a seven-course program 
And in 2020, I couldn't go into the classroom, so I recorded it on Zoom. And a number of people asked about the class and could they get the material or whatever. And I was like, oh, well, I have these Zoom videos. I'll just put it up on my website and anyone can go through the course. It's free. Anyone can do it. And just like Vince said, uh, his daughter is going through it. And that is what I find a lot of people do is they can say everything until they're blue in their face and their child just doesn't listen because it's the parent. But when they see it from somebody else, which is probably the same material that you would teach her yourself, but it's from this other person that is teaching it in a classroom environment and so forth. So yeah, if anyone wants to see the course, feel free to go to marksmoneymind.com and just look for financial literacy course. It's there, it's in video form and the handouts and everything are there. So yeah, I just put Great. it out there for anyone that wants to see it and go Great. through it. And I so appreciate you doing that. And you are teaching it to high school seniors, is Correct. that right? Yes. But the material would be good for anyone. Yeah, to I've had a through, lot of right? adults do it themselves. I mean, it is somewhat geared towards the high school students. So when we talk about, I mean, we go through the your net worth statement, we go through tracking your spending, which applies to anyone. We talk about all different types of loans, but I do spend a little bit more time on student loans, for example. I certainly talk about compounding and opening a Roth IRA and how advantageous that can be for a young person. But yeah, it's applicable to anyone. You don't have to be a high school student to benefit from it. Great, great. Because there's folks in our audience that some of these concepts, again, when they first get started, they don't really know what direction to go in and maybe don't understand some of the beginning concepts that are needed. So I think that would be a great place for yeah. them to look. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Fitz. Yeah. All yeah. right. Next. That was a, Next. That was a good Brianna. Nice, good. This one's you got it. You got it. I, cause it no. It's more lively when people laugh because then it doesn't feel like you're answering, like you're on the stand. So, so next we're going to talk with Brianna. She's the den mom of the slackers. She's the one that gets us organized. She's the one that, she has cooked all of our meals while we've been here. She's the one that rented the Airbnb. She puts it all together because honestly, the rest of us are just, we, we have a saying that we're just too retired for, when somebody wants us to do something we don't want to do, it's like, no, nope, I'm too retired for that. <laughs> we're, we're all true slackers when it comes to organizing, but luckily we have Brianna. And Brianna does all of this while still working full time. So she has not retired yet. No, so Brianna, yet. welcome. Thank you. So uh, we were just chatting previously that you are actually the founding member of the Slackers group with Kevin. Am I correct? That would be correct. Uh, so tell we us how it actually transpired. How did it all come to be? Well, we have the missing ninth person of our Slackers who was looking for some conversation. Kevin and I got on a couple calls. We were doing that with the three of us. And we met some of you in person at the Roundup that year, an event from another FI programmer community. And I remember tapping Kevin going, hey, I think we should add a couple people. And we did that on that infamous three hour walk that we had. <laughs> and we started the to three lay hour out. tour. It was a three hour tour of Fort Worth. Looking, looking for the Fort Worth stockyards. <laughs> yep, going the death I can march. see it, but I think <laughs> it was called the Death March. We all survived. It was called Weeding Out the Wee. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, oh, so we goodness. started that. And like others have already said, I really enjoy the calls we meet about once a month. It's a couple hours long. Talked about everything from the financial side to the life side to the vacationing and everything else. And it's something I look forward to every month. Mm -hmm. And it's a great time for all of us. Well, grateful for the group. Well, thanks for putting it together. Right. Thanks right. for yeah. asking us to join, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Too That's much right. Kevin otherwise, just too <laughs> yeah. much Kevin. That does seem to be the, the case. And one of the things that really just popped in my head is we've talked about how we have our financial conversations and we do fun things and we get together. But the group has continued to morph and change because it started just on Zoom and with the occasional getting to see each other in person. And now we're traveling together. And 
that has meant so much for Stephen and I to have a group that that we just do life together. I mean, it's almost become like family. I mean, you guys are in in a lot of ways closer than than I am even with some of my family. Yeah, I would agree. I think finding the slackers and doing as much as we've done, one of the things that I've recognized is we're friends by choice, not by consequence. Not that friends of consequence aren't important, but you've got friends at work and whether you take a vacation or retire, sometimes they stick around and sometimes they don't, you know? Mm-hmm. And about the time that we all started getting together, I was realizing I, I was finding a new tribe. So much so that some of my local friends were like, where are you? What are you doing? Are you ghosting us? And I was just trying to explain, I was in a different part of my life where I was exploring things. And this group, because of the diversity of ages, relationships, statuses, geography, and all of that just has such a richness to it. Because I think we are the Motley Crew. I mean, I joke that we're like the United Colors of Anaton. You've got everything in here. And you can find an answer because everyone's got a different experience and it helps to shape that in terms of what it looks like. And so this is something that I intentionally dove into when I did a couple of years ago. I kind of fell into Phi. Um, wasn't looking for a number, wasn't planning on it. I always planned a traditional retirement. I didn't know any differently, but I also wasn't thinking any differently. And through this work, I realized, huh, look at that. That date can get pulled back. And look, I have other opportunities. And I think like a lot of us here and others, we tend to work a lot. And when you do that, you don't really pick up your head to see everything else. You don't understand what else is out there. And so this group is a nice reminder for me to say, okay, start slacking, like let go, still do the work but it's not worth the 150, 175, 200. You can do it, but there are other things. And it's sort of opening the aperture to remind myself that there are other things in life that are important. Mm -hmm. So you guys are a good reminder. And so, you know, I'm interested of your perspective because you are, most of us here, all of us here are retired other than you. No, no, no. (laughs) But I'm... You are. <laughs> You're so mean. <laughs> she takes I'm care saying, of us. I'm saying that in a, I'm saying that in a good way because I admire somebody that is inquisitive about the subject well before even kind of contemplating it. So what are you finding is beneficial to hanging out with a bunch of retirees that bunch of people old farts. No, but I also yeah, think about it from the standpoint of there's the whole concept of Coast Fi too, right? Mm-hmm. So you are striving for this financial independence period where you can make decisions, but you're not necessarily interested. You may be interested in retirement. You don't have to be interested in retirement. So I'm curious from your perspective, what do you find that you are learning or, or potentially not learning <laughs> from this crowd. And because I'm, I'm just very interested in the perspective of somebody that is pre-retirement. Sure. Let me give you a little context in terms of how I ended up here. I have a really good friend that I met at work who had told me that in your early 50s, start paying attention to this. And that's assuming a traditional retirement. He had retired at 55 but only decided at 53 that he wanted to. And by the time the opportunity came, he didn't have the runway that he wanted. So the thing he taught me, which I really coveted, which is something that the community here is working toward as well, is time is a gift and also something that you cannot reverse. It's the one thing you can't, but you can move forward with. So with whatever time you have, be mindful of that and use it to your best of ability. Doesn't matter if the runway is 20 years or if it's two years, but just be mindful of it and just be aware of it and be attentive. So that was what my friend really taught me, which is why I jumped into the group. The other thing that I would say that kind of shaped the notion of retirement for me was I have a job that I really enjoy. It's very intense. And so there's not a lot of off time, which means there's not a lot of respite. And when I was younger, it was easy to do. And when I was a workaholic, it was easy to do because you had blinders on and it was all that there was. And I've often described to my friends that there is an off-ramp in my future, but I don't know what it is. When people ask me, what do you want to do in retirement? What do you want to do when you finish this job? I tell them I don't really know, 
but my bags will be packed and they'll be at the door so that when I see that exit ramp, I'll identify it for what it is and be ready to take it. I don't know what that is. I don't know when it's going to happen. It'll be situational. It might be something different today than two years from now. But at that point, I'll at least have given it enough thought to the best of my ability to prepare myself because I know that I'm sort of over the hump of worrying if I can do it. It's now just a matter of when and having that freedom to make that decision, but also getting my ducks in a row as I tend to do with things and just over-organize and over-analyze. It just, it gives me options. I'm one of these people who love to look at things in 360. It's either a blessing or a curse. Some people think I'm absolutely nuts because I don't stop analyzing, but it's not paralysis. It's there are lots of mistakes and lots of learnings that we can have. And that's what the slackers bring to me because I don't need to make all the mistakes or the life learns by myself. And there's a lot of other stuff to learn. So why not leverage on the people that and the relationships that you have to learn from others? So, I mean, that's sort of why I'm interested in the retirement thing. And it's not about retirement. It's about what's next. And that's the way I'm trying to frame it right now. Well, I also like the way that you're kind of living a life of balance. So you're not, it's not this end goal. I need to retire and then I can do these things. You're doing all the things that we are all doing in retirement and working at the same time and making it work, which I think is great because I think a lot of people think you got to get to this point of retirement and then I can do things. Whereas your evidence that you can do it while you're working. So for those people who feel that I'm not going to be able to retire because of a financial reason, and that's not your case, but I'm just saying for those people that it is, it doesn't mean that you can't do those things that you are thinking that you have to wait to retirement to do. You can do those now. One thing I would I would recommend to folks who are interested in thinking about this, again, I've been blessed with friends who have given me some really good advice along the way. And early in my career, I had a friend who said, Take a day off once a quarter. It doesn't matter what it is. Sleep in, go to the spa, go to the gym. Just take care of yourself one day every quarter. That's not a huge commitment. And it's a reminder for me that there's other stuff. And that was before the slackers and everything else I did. But it's training that muscle to say you're giving yourself permission, even if it's just one day. It's, it's a little bitty thing, but it's a breakout. And on those days when I used to take them, it wasn't laundry day. It wasn't about maintenance. wasn't about... It was just a, a mini slacker day, a pre-slacker day. And that helped to anchor me so that I wasn't just always in the zone. I'm often in the zone and I don't know how to break out, but that was just the abrupt disruptor I needed to just make sure I could do that. And that one day became a weekend, a long weekend, a week. And so it's grown into other things, but at my comfort level, at my pace, it wasn't like, oh, you have all your vacation, just drop it all and let's just take it all. And it doesn't matter what you do. So, mm -hmm. um, I really love that, and I love I love this discussion because we've talked a lot tonight about retirement and whether we are or aren't retired. And there's a lot of folks in our audience that retirement may not even be what they're thinking about right now. I mean, I don't want everyone to get the idea that we're saying that is the one end goal. I mean, some people just either love what they do and don't ever plan on retiring. Some people are in a financial position where that's not going to be anywhere in the near future and they know they're going to have to work for a while. And so part of the process is not only trying to get your, your finances in order to, to make your life more stable and more comfortable and more doable, but it's to figure out how to to keep going with what you have, how to create your best life. I think retirement is more of a mindset than it is anything else. It's more about the journey. It's about the preparation, but it's not a single point of destination. It's a state of being. And this may sound corny, but I am working. But in some ways, I feel like I'm already retired. And it's not because I'm traveling with the slackers. It's the balance that I have. It's the fact that I have comfort knowing that there's a date for that I'm comfortable with, even though I don't know what that magic date is. And with this group, it's been great because sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough and it's non-traditional what I'm doing. Like Mark said, I'm doing all this stuff while I'm working. And now some of my colleagues joke, like, are, are you working this week? Where are you this week? And 
with my friends, I was being a little flippant to say, yeah, I'm just working between my vacations, which honest <laughs> to okay. God, I don't think two yeah. years ago I would have, I mean, I would have been like, who is that person? How could they possibly say that? But it's, mm-hmm. it's a state of mind that you've got to get comfortable with what you want and what you need and give yourself permission to just get there. And there's not a single path. And honestly, whatever choice you make, you can always unmake it, change your mind and do it differently the next day. That's true. Short of being dead, there are always other options. So that's one of the things I remind myself. It's like, okay, if it didn't work, then you pick yourself up. Sometimes you need to take a breath. Sometimes you need to take a break and you just keep going. Mm-hmm. I don't think the people listening have any idea how much of a high achiever, mm-hmm. super organized, super professional person Brian is. So she sounds all zen, surrounded by a bunch of crazy slackers, but she's living a zen life in the middle of a crazy work life. And that's an amazing balance that she's created. And that doesn't happen with most people. It just sounds so calm when you say this, but we know you're, you're type A++, (laughs) not A. And so that needs to be, you can have both. It just takes time and intention. It's learned. It's learned. And it's it's a constant reminder. I mean, you guys know how goofy and spazzy I am. It's just like, but that's part of my energy and that's what feeds me. That's part of my childhood and that's who I became. So I often say to my friends, if you know where my off button is or where the any off button is, <laughs> I would welcome you to show me because I would really <laughs> love to know how to turn this down. But no one has been able to be courageous enough to tell me where the off button is, damn it. So you just roll with it. Mm-hmm. So, Brown, I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes with some nitty gritty sure. detail. Like, so you're at some point in time, you're planning on retiring. Mm-hmm. So what are you doing now to prepare for that? I am revisiting the things that I enjoy to do in my vacations. There are certain places I go on a regular basis. There is a place I vacation the last 25 years that I've been very involved in the community when I'm there. I don't have a second home there, but I just participate in a lot of the activities and programs. And I've just started to explore in terms of volunteer activities or ways that I can maybe get a part-time gig. And so the place that I visit is a place that there's a lot of theater. I didn't study drama. I'm not an actor, but it intrigues me because it's storytelling at its finest where you can sort of pull threads through to say whether it's a contemporary play or a really old one. Sometimes it's sad to see that some things haven't changed, but the question I always bring back is, how does that impact me and what is the lesson that I'm trying to get out of it? Whether it's creativity or problem solving or anything else. And this place happens to be in Canada. I live in Michigan. So I had asked one of the staff there at a recent event who was American. I said, so how do they pay you? Do they pay you on the Canadian payroll or is there a American payroll because it's a not-for-profit. And I learned that, nope, they did some work on their 5013C and they hired him through there. And I'm like, that's an opportunity. So right now I'm cataloging opportunities. I'm having informational conversations with people that I've met along the way to say, if I wanted to give, what would that look like? If I wanted to give more than that, what would that look like? Some of the folks at these different places that I visit know me as a regular, even though I'm not geographically near but I'm very consistent. My name is unique. It's easy to kind of remember me versus others. So I've made those relationships, not with any intention of investing in them in a future job or gig, but it's finding those passions. And the other thing that I'm planning that I've mentioned to my friends a lot is go back to your childhood. What did you do when you enjoyed stuff, when you didn't have any other limitations? I mean, I did a lot of crafts. I did a lot of volunteering and that's all disappeared in my professional career. But putting them back on paper going, that energized me once upon a time when I didn't have to worry about other stuff. Is it time to even just try it again and say, is it still appropriate? Is there something that's a derivative of, or is that just something that was a one-time thing? But folks who struggle with, I don't know what I'm going to do in retirement. I just say, when you were six or eight and you were able to play, what were you doing? Because that's something that at least you had an interest in at one point in your life. And maybe that'll be something Mm -hmm. you can build. Mm -hmm. And kind of like Bob, test driving. It Mm -hmm. sounds like you're test driving retirement in different ways and seeing how things work and deciding maybe that's for me, maybe that's not for me and seeing kind of what sticks. Yeah, it's, it's actually been quite surprising. I've had two or three people in different parts of my life literally 
jokingly, but I don't know how much they were joking, of saying, when are you retiring and when can you come join us? Which I find very flattering. Because if they actually knew how kooky I was, I don't know that they'd want to do that. <laughs> but it reminds me that I have passions in other places and it comes through in ways that I may not even realize myself. Mm -hmm. So how are you preparing financially? for that day, whenever that day comes. I have my ducks in a row. I have, I've been chasing tax strategies a lot more than anything else because that friend that I mentioned earlier was telling me about the gift of time. And one of the things that I learned was time was something that could be very beneficial from a tax situation, from a planning situation, the gotchas of not paying attention, which he experienced. And so I was, I've been very obsessed about that to the degree of, I don't want to lose the gift of time that I have because if I lose it, you can't get it. And like I said before, it doesn't matter if you're catching up or you're fully prepared. It's just whatever you want to make of that. So that's a lot of what I'm preparing for. I did something a couple of years ago that wasn't intentional for firing or retiring, but took a relatively large promotion about five, six years ago. And at that point, I decided to just draw a line in the sand with my salary. So in my mind's eye, in the way that I budget or spend, I'm living on circa 2017 funds. Everything else that's come after that, the bonuses, the merits, they all get swept somewhere else. Because I convinced myself, which I knew way beforehand, but didn't do until 17, which is I didn't need lifestyle creep. but more junk than I know what to do with now. So on the game's foot to try to empty my house. So I'm trying to be mindful about that. And that's helped. I started to ask myself, well, how much do you really need all this stuff? And I realized I really don't need this. It's it's more of a muscle memory, right? Amazon Prime can be an easy one-click button, and sometimes I don't even know what, what's in the box when it shows up. So it's like, I don't think I need that. So that's part of how I've done it. So do you, or have you always had your savings on automatic? I had when I was probably four or five years into my career, I had student debt like everyone else. I came from a family that had a lot of debt, so, you know, didn't come from wealth at all. But what I did, and I don't really know how or why I did it, because I don't call anyone recommending it to me, but I always maxed out my 401k once I started working. And in my early years of working, it was actually quite comical, because every year the 401 max would grow faster than my raise, and so I was making less and less for the, probably the first five or six years. But I never questioned it because I never saw the money. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said before, I always thought I'd have a traditional retirement, 65, 67. That's just what I assumed. I didn't really think about it all. When I started crunching the numbers, I thought, wow, there are possibilities here. And it was on autopilot, but it wasn't, I don't know that it was consciously deliberate other than I just wanted to max it out. I couldn't explain to you why that was a, other than maybe Kevin's comment of being an overachiever. Okay, if there's a box to be filled, let's fill it all the way. Okay, is there any more? How much, how much more do I actually put in that bucket? But that was part of what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that's so important for the folks in our audience is to, if they haven't, to set up their savings on automatic and to, to just run with the concept of pay yourself first. I know that you, Mark, you taught that to your daughter yeah, so one of the things we did in our family was always save 20% of everything we made. That was just kind of a, it came from originally the Wealthy Barber book that I read, and they talked about save 10%, and we decided to save 20%. I like your idea of kind of getting to a, a level of spending that you're comfortable with yeah. and saying, well, any raises and so forth, I get beyond that, I'm just going to bank. And certainly if you can max out your 401k, especially starting at a young age, that's what we did. And that was what enabled us to retire early. Now that's hard for people to do kind of right out of the gate, but working towards that is definitely beneficial. But, and certainly the savings on autopilot is, mm -hmm. is definitely something to do. And, and as you've probably found, the benefits don't come overnight. It does take some time for all of this to accrue and compound and so forth. So. Just because you turn on your 401k to a higher level doesn't mean it's going to all be solved by next year. Right. Oh, and I would say for the community, do the best you can with what you have. That's really, there's an author, Arthur Ashe, well, I'm going to get it wrong. Use what you have, do what you can. Start here now, use what you have, do what you can. It's just, 
use everything that's in your space and your accessibility. And we all want more. We all want to do better. And it's just using what you have and leveraging that. There's no perfect scenario. Everyone's scenario is different. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that all of us, no matter what our age, wish we had started sooner, wish we had done more. And for someone who is young and just starting their career, then dumping what they can into the 401k from the get-go is a great idea because you've never seen it, you've right. never experienced it, you don't know that you're missing it. Right. And that's something that probably our audience is going to struggle with is, I've been used to spending this money and now I need to maybe start the 401k contributions for the first time, but it is... Mm -hmm. It is a door that you can walk through. It might be painful at first, but it will be so worth it. And I don't, we as humans adjust pretty easily, Yeah, I think, and, and sometimes pretty quickly. So I think even if you've never started that, you've never used that saving muscle, that you can start putting money or you can in your 401k. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the whole thing. In the next, folks have a, a job with regular cycles of merit or increases just do a little bit more. I mean, incremental is just as important. Something is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And I find that, so one of the ways that I was able to max out initially was when I got a, a job change and I got a big, um, not a massive salary increase, but it was yeah. a salary increase. And when you get those, especially when you change to a new job and maybe it came with a promotion and maybe some more uh, income, that's kind of the easy time to make those changes. So right. instead of trying to cut back, use those opportunities when raises come or bonus comes yeah. or something like that, or a job change comes with a higher pay, that's the time to really move the needle where it doesn't pinch you as much. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's true. That's totally true. agree. Well, this has been great. So Brianna, same question I've asked everyone else. What did the slackers mean to you? Slackers mean fun. The slackers mean balance. And there's a lot of wisdom in the group. And everyone has a very different perspective. We have lots of common interests, but we all come at it very differently. And that's what I appreciate. So I, you would suggest for anybody to try to find a group that... I would say, yeah, find a group. Or even if it's not something like the slackers with a larger group of six to eight to nine. I mean, there are folks that I've met along the way and we have a conversation once a quarter, but what's really interesting is they ended up being like two or three hour conversations. They remind me of slacker calls, but it's because there's a comfort of getting into that detail and creating a safety zone to say there are no dumb questions, there are, nothing's off the table. And to the point of trust that's been discussed before, it's hard to trust new people, but people also need a safe place to just unload and just be free to babble, rant, just free flow. And out of that, there are things that come, but sometimes folks have to vocalize it or write it down to crystallize and filter it. You know, it's easy to talk to ourselves in our head, but we start to spin pretty hard because we're good at manipulating ourselves. Mm -hmm. Sometimes having somebody else just as a sounding board makes a big difference. That's true. And you've just reminded me of something that a year ago, I had a family member that had a devastating accident. Yeah. And... That had nothing to do with money. It didn't have anything to do with anyone else in this group. But I was able to come sort of dump my my emotions and my grief with you guys. And y'all were there for me to just help me process through that. So it's not always about money. No. We're a family yeah. through and through. That's yeah. From the big ring to the love, <laughs> both sides of it. <laughs> Even Kevin. Even Kevin. love Oh my God, that was horrible. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this short series of catching up to Fies on the road, this time with the Slackers. Mark and I wanted to just take a minute and give you an idea of why we actually recorded this slice of life with the Slackers. We view this group as our, what we call board of advisors. So Mark, can you tell us a little bit about the board of advisors? 
Yeah, so the board of advisors sounds like a very specific big word term, but basically it's just a peer group of individuals where we are all in similar stages of life. Many of us are either retired or close to retirement, and we're all going through some of the same thought items, whether it's financial or just life in general, how to live our best life. So we kind of created this group of individuals and it just started off as kind of answering each other's kind of financial questions. And once we got more comfortable with each other and started learning more about each other's lives, it's really become a group of good friends that talk about finances, talk about life and travel together and do things together. So I would highly encourage people to potentially seek out a group of a handful of people. I would say you wouldn't, you would want to keep it to a limited number of people. We currently have nine in our group and for you to be able to bounce ideas off and also to back each other up. There have been situations where we have been able to go to talk to people even one-on-one -on -one within the group about certain things going on in our lives that have been super helpful. So it's really a, a group of peer advisors, not advisors like an accountant or a lawyer. That would be more like a board of directors, which would be ooh, really big. <laughs> but this is just a group of peer advisors and it has been a really fantastic group to be part of. And, and I would suggest other people consider doing that for themselves. I agree. We have gained, I think individually, we've each gained a lot of value out of this group. It's turned into a group that we just do life with together and have fun with and travel with together. And one of the things that, that I know was mentioned in, in the recordings with the folks was the trust. And of course, that doesn't happen overnight, but I feel like we have become close enough that we can trust each other with any information. I mean, sometimes we talk about our real numbers and the strategies that we're thinking about, and it's nice to just have someone else that can listen to it, another set of eyes and ears that can listen to what you're thinking about doing and give you some some thoughts about whether that's going in the right direction or not. Yeah, it's been a really good group. I think we got lucky in that we were able to hit it off right away. We didn't have to like kick anyone out of the group <laughs> or find new members. It, it just kind of all gelled. It did. So I think we were lucky in that respect, but I encourage people to seek out people in similar that are walking similar steps to you but not the exact same steps to mm -hmm. you. that's right and the other thing that i like is that we we have as we have talked about before a variety of ages and stages so it's nice to have someone who maybe has been down that road ahead of you that can kind of make you aware of the pitfalls or what works well or what doesn't and so that's been really nice and i also wanted to say this is not also to take the place of a board of directors. If you need an accountant or a lawyer or a financial advisor, then by all means, seek out those services. But this has just been a peer group that has really worked well for us. And I would encourage anybody to try to form a group like that. Either find one maybe that uh, already exists, or if not, just start your own. And you don't have to be live in the same city. I mean, that's, that's evident. Nobody has to live next to each other anymore. We're spread all over. Well, thanks for joining me, Mark. Thanks for helping out with this little slice of life with the Slackers. We hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time on Catching Up to Fi. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Fi. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.